Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 253 for the 5th of Av and a leap year. So first of all, I want to thank everybody for bearing with me while my microphone situation is less than ideal. I keep having issues with my mic for some reason. I just ordered a new one, so it should be arriving later today. Uh, so once again, thank you for bearing with me while the audio sound might not be perfect. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get into today's podcast. So today's podcast, we're going to be talking about happiness, how to achieve happiness in a way that might be a little bit unexpected. So one of the most famous books about happiness, at least in our times, is by Gretchen, is by a woman named Gretchen Rubin called The Happiness Project. In The Happiness Project, Gretchen Rubin goes out to explore what happiness is and what cultures are the happiest and how to achieve happiness in a most ideal state. I actually did not really like this book very much and it was hard to really pinpoint why. And truthfully, it's been a while since I read the book so I may not be getting all the details really perfectly correctly, but from what I remember, the thing that really irked me about the book was that first of all, the whole idea of pursuing happiness to begin with seemed to be something that it's like, why are we taking this for granted? Why are we assuming that the goal of life is to be happy? That's not necessarily a, a virtue that I aspire to. And she kind of like took it for granted. That's, that's kind of the point of life is just to be as happy as possible. And that's not necessarily a Torah idea. And it's not really something that I personally ascribe to as well. And secondly, her whole idea of how to pursue that happiness really had a very self-centered kind of approach to it. As much as some of her happiness project ideas did involve being generous, giving charity and that kind of thing, it always kind of had this like ulterior selfish motive behind it. It was always about this idea of ultimately, ultimately making a person happy. So I guess if I had to sum it up, the thing that really bothered me mostly about this book is this idea of entitlements, this concept that we're all entitled to be happy. And it's something that is kind of like our right and we have to go out and pursue it and get it in any way that we can. Now, when it comes to Judaism, when it comes to Torah, and especially what we're going to focus on in today's episode, is that interestingly enough, happiness is not something that we should think of as kind of like an entitlement. And if anything, the best way to be truly happy is to not feel entitled, is to actually feel really humble, to humble yourself and to recognize that you don't have a right to anything and to realize just how low and how flawed of a person you are, to go away from self-righteousness and really embrace your lowliness, really. So the basic idea is that when you really recognize yourself for who you are, uh, and you recognize, like we've been talking a lot about self-examination, becoming sober, becoming aware of how flawed we are, how many mistakes we are, all of this kind of stuff, this will actually, it seems like this would make a person sad at first glance because it seems like you'd be walking around like, oh, wow, woe is me. I'm such a horrible person. I did all these bad things. But we're going to flip it on its head today and we're going to talk about how, in fact, walking around with this awareness of how flawed you are as a person, of how many mistakes you've done, as long as you kind of don't make this as like the core part of your identity, but it's just like sort of an awareness that you have in the back of your mind at all times, this is actually going to make you very grateful. It will give you this tremendous sense of gratitude and indeed joy for anything in your life that is even remotely good. So let's get into the text and see how the Ultra Abba explains this. So this is for context, we're at the end of chapter 11 today, the chapter right before we're nearing the end of the Sefer of Igarasa Tshuva. And so here we go. 
So the altar begins by quoting a something from Tehillim, a pasuk from Tehillim. This is from Tehillim chapter 51, verse 5, where it says, which means, and my sin is before me always. And so at first glance, this idea of where David HaMelech says, my sin is before me always, this might make a person feel really sad. They might think to themselves, wow, isn't this going to make me really sad? If I'm always thinking about my past sins, if I'm constantly walking around like, oh, you know, with this sense of like regret and remorse and self-deprecation and all of that kind of thing. So the altar of specifies, he says, no, the idea of having your sin before you always is not in order to make you sad and lowly. And the proof of this, that this is not the purpose of this idea, is that further on in this very same Tehillim, when we get to verse 10, it says, Tashmi'eni sason v'simcha v'gomel, that let me hear gladness and joy. And then it keeps going and it says, V'ruach nedivati smechani v'gomel. So, and that's in verse 14 where it says, Uphold me with a spirit of magnanimity." So, this means that there's something about like having your sin before you that not only is it a contradiction to being happy but it actually could lead you to a feeling of great joy and gladness and even to a spirit of magnanimity like feeling really good right so about yourself so how does this how, how do we how do we reconcile this what does this mean exactly so we can understand this through understanding the idea of chuva ila this this idea of supernal shuva that we've been talking about because the supernal shuva that we've been talking about in the past few episodes which you can go back and review to get a refresher on that is something that is very it makes up it, it should be done with a, a sense of true joy this is the if, just to recall this idea of the supernal shuva what that involves is when the godly soul really strives to be close to God and it's this striving that is done with a lot of joy because it's like this recognition of its godly source it's a recognition that truly it is a part of God so okay so how, so what does this mean to break it down if we look back at that verse in Tehillim that when it says my sin is before me always the Hebrew word that's used is negdi which negdi means like opposite like but at a certain distance it's not like super super close to a person it's 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 like opposite a person that you're like um like a an example of this the altar actually brings is from shmuel base chapter 18 verse 13 where it says that you should stand at a distance so it's implied that this whole idea of mineged is that you should be at a distance or also there's another verse this one's from Bamidbar chapter 2 verse 2 where it says that the that the people should stand around the tent the um the tent of meeting the oil moed but they should be naked so it's like sort of like they shouldn't be right close to it they should be like a little far from it and in fact this is exactly how Rashi explains this word naked in the context of this verse is that it's uh, that it should be a little bit like further away opposite and a in a distance and so what does this mean basically what this means as that my sin is before me always is that it's like a person should never grow really haughty but rather they should always be humble of spirit before every single person because they will always remember their past sins so it's like the basic idea is that the tanya is teaching us that we should never become self-righteous we shouldn't look at other people and be like oh wow look at that person look what they're doing i can't believe they're behaving in this way wow i'm so much better than that you should always remember that no you're not better than that you should always have in mind your sins your misgivings your mistakes that you make and not only that when we have this recognition then we'll realize that this that becoming joyful becoming happy it's actually going to help us to remember our past sins because the more we remember our past sins then we will accept whatever misfortunes come to us with uh with joy because whether it's whether uh bad things happen to us from heaven or whether they come from people whether it's in speech or in deed then we'll accept it like wholeheartedly like basically we'll realize like what i was saying in the introduction that we're not entitled to anything so it's like if something bad happens to us we won't play the victim we won't be like i can't believe this is happening to me i'm me i'm such a good person we'll realize you know what i'm not such a good person and it's like okay so these things are happening to me but i i'm not great so i'll accept it with joy because i'll, I'll realize that i you know that i'm not perfect basically and this actually 
says the altar Rebbe that, um, and this is in brackets, he says that this is good advice, very practical advice, to stay away from getting angry and from taking offense in any kind of way. So similar idea, right? That it's like, if you really have this, I, this certain humility, if you're constantly aware of the fact that you are a flawed person, you're not gonna get angry at people because if somebody does something to you that might make you angry, you won't, like, where, where does anger come from? Anger comes from arrogance and a certain se sense of self-righteousness. We were like, how could this person do this to me? Like, who do they think they are? Well, it's not so much about who they think they are, it's who do you think you are that you think that you're better than being ang having somebody be angry at you. So when you recognize your, your place, when you recognize that you're not perfect, you'll accept these uh, variations with, with a certain joy. And then the Alter Rebbe goes on and he says that this explains what the sages teach in the Gemara. And this is taken from two different places. One is Shabbos, page 88b, and one is Gittin, page 3060, where the sages there outline three kinds of people. What are the three kinds of people? The first one is those people who are humiliated, but yet do not humiliate in turn. Those people who hear themselves being insulted, but do not answer. So they just like take the insults and, and stay silent. And then the third category is people who uh, perform out of love, like do the mitzvahs out of love, do Hashem's commandments out of love, and are happy in suffering. These three kind of people, then the um, the Gemara goes on and, sa and says, and this is implied here in the Tanya, but it's not explicitly said. Uh, this is from Shoftim, uh, chapter 5 verse 31 where it says which literally means that their love will be like the sun when it goes forth in all of its might so the basic idea is that uh, that all of these kind of people basically they all fall into this category of somebody who accepts humiliation accepts being insulted accepts suffering these kind of people are truly happy and they're able to serve God with joy and it's they're like the sun in this like radiant kind of way and then the altar Rebbe concludes and he says and this is from the gemara in masech Rosh Hashanah, page 17a where it teaches that anybody who passes over his feelings his transgressions will be passed over so meaning to say like if you learn to not take things personally if you if you don't take things personally and you don't let the insults get to you and like your feelings get to you if you're not like a slave to your feelings then God will make it so that your transgressions will not uh, take over you either. Like they'll be passed over, they'll be forgiven, forgotten, whatever it is. So the basic idea there is that it's like there's a certain recognition that first of all, aside from the fact that like recognizing that our sins make us imperfect and thus we have no entitlement to anything at all and this is going to make us feel happy for anything that we get we'll also recognize that any suffering that we experience is actually a form and a way of like it's something that we kind of deserve and it's a way of like cleansing us from whatever sins that we did do so that's it for today and tomorrow very exciting we're going to be learning the final chapter of this section of Iger Satshuva the Tanya so exciting how we're getting through these uh these sections here stick with it and i will speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarit switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather abraham yitzhak ben benjamin cohen of blessed memory music by shoshana if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.